Hello, welcome to all my combo lords joining me here today in my room where we're looking at some strange graphs. And this is a type of graph that I have on the screen as an example of how a single equation with here I have a variable, my a I'm allowed to edit. It's essentially the circle equation except with signs on it. If I didn't have those signs, editing this circle would just expand it and shrink it. But when I stick signs in front of those, it gets pretty wacky. This is a fun one that I found once we've seen in streams before, and not the main topic of today, just a little introductory example of how a single equation can generate such cool shapes. Even if I don't allow my A to change, the shape it makes at A equals zero is pretty magnificent as well as the shape it makes at a equals one. We can also make an inequality to make it arguably even cooler, greater or less than that amount. There is now a equals one. There is now a equals zero. But the reason this is different from the normal or the other types of graphs we're gonna be doing is this uses X's and Y's. Whereas we're gonna be doing something called polar coordinates. Now. Let me first start with a little intro. Love you all. Thank you for joining me on this Demotro channel, which despite being the one with more subscribers, is my more freeform, casual, almost bonus channel. Make sure you have checked out my latest main combo class episode. The last one I put out that's linked in the description on the combo class channel is a more thoroughly edited piece of work from me. However, I do like doing a lot of little bonus bits of content on here. To me, the shorts are bonus as well, but those draw a lot of people. To me, the live streams are bonus, but they're fun. I get to share little fun details, such as graphs I was fiddling around with, with you folks without worrying if it's perfect enough to sculpt into a full episode. And so, make sure you've caught the... You're up to date on, let's take a peek on all of the Combo Class episodes. These are the classics. These are my works of art I drop. Now here on Demotro channel, we got some more various stuff. You know, our shorts haven't put them out in a while, but these things hit hard. We got some videos, and if you hit the live tab, you can catch up someday if you're ever bored and you ever go into bed and need something to watch that's like a podcast, but more comboed out. Then you can go back and we've fiddled with graphs in some fun ways. There's some graphs, there's some graphs. We've had fun doing some room, there's some graphs, doing some room graph streams. And usually we use XY type coordinates, but there's another type that's an option called polar coordinates. Now, if I say X squared plus Y squared is more than A, well, let's just say equals for now to keep it simple. Well, I got to zoom in and I set A to zero, so it's not doing anything. But when I have an actual non-zero A, I get a radius for a circle. This is a circle equation in terms of X, Y coordinates. But there are other ways to measure a coordinate plane. I could say for a given angle, I could be from the origin. How far do I put the filled in dot on my equation? How far from the origin? is any given solution if I am that angle from it. And that taps into what's called polar coordinates. We could see uh, here's Wolfram Math World's a little picture and demonstration of how they're related to normal coordinates and we could translate them into the more common XY coordinate plane. But they're a more circular form that embraces this circular equation where, for example, on Desmos, if I type R equals one, they know that I'm going for a thing called polar coordinates and that I'm saying that the radius is one and I get a circle. Let's say radius is A. I can adjust A and I have my circle equation right there. So what can we do when we are playing with the circle as one side of our equation? And no, they do not let me do things like sine of the radius. They, that's not allowed on Desmos, even though we could try and find a way to make that exist in math. 
but beyond a circle, what if I say radius equals the variable we're going to use, theta, being the angle at which we have curved further from the origin. So if I say r equals theta, here it's like dependent on what angle I am is how far I am. If I'm a little bit a degree, I'm a little far. If I'm so many degrees that I'm more than 360, I'm also pretty far. We wrap around. But not in degrees is how we need to measure it. I'm using that term just because it's taught in schools a lot. There are, there are better ways we can divide it. I'm a fan of radians. But here, that's just the start of what our polar coordinates can do. We've made funny bug looking things with them before. They do all sorts of neat tricks. Like, let's just try a random one here. Let's say sine of tangent of theta. It's a bug. Check it out. I, I literally, maybe I have it in the back of my memory. I didn't know that this one was gonna hit a bug. I just knew that when we were doing stuff like this, we hit a lot of bugs. Tell me that's not a little butterfly or moth or something along those lines. Let's throw an A in there. Now I can make it... Ooh, okay, that was too much to throw the A inside all of that. Let's throw an A on the outside. Now I can make it sort of uh, grow and shrink. What if I put an A in there? We can make it flat. Look, it's like a butterfly flapping its wings. Now, these were ones we found in an earlier stream when we were looking at bugs there. And someday I'm going to put these into a main episode. There will come a time where there will be a main episode about the craziness of these graphs. But when we get there, we're going to have to actually look deeper into the math at like why this is the set of points where sine of the square of the x-coordinate plus sine of the square of the y-coordinate was, say, 1 added together or 0 added together. So we will make an episode about these someday, and polar coordinates might show up in that. So we're going to dive into some of those. This is a very late night stream. It just passed 11.11, a very hyper 11 time here in my time zone. When I do the streams in the middle of the night, I know not as many people can catch them. But remember that we do have this live tab that saves them all in the future. So whenever you're bored, you got hours of combos. And whenever you're ready to learn the very uh, precise stuff, you can go to our combo class channel. When I say R, I kind of mean mine, but I don't want to sound greedy because y you folks help me and my camera people help me and etc. Now, here's some polar coordinate explanations. The other tabs I have pulled up are something, uh, I'll mention this at the end. We'll do our polar coordinates first. Now, I was fiddling around with these. How can I play with my polar coordinates to do funny things? Like, let's just start with, if I say theta times A. Now I can sort of... make this circle do funny things. Now they have a range for how far they want us to check the angles. Because if I do it forever, if I go like negative a thousand to a thousand... This one kind of works. It makes a doubled when I go negative. Let's say zero to a thousand. This one just gets bigger. But other ones blot out the whole screen when we try and make the angle too high. The default on Desmos seems to be 12 pi because radians and things are measured in increments of pi. You know, a classic circular ratio. In fact, I must mention that yesterday, July 22nd, could have been considered Pi Approximation Day. You know, our calendars are throwing us random dates that we assign holidays. So if we assign a mathematical holiday, we're already stuck within the realm of playing by the calendar's rules, assuming our mathematical holiday relates to the number of the date and month and such. So Pi Day is often declared as March 14th. While I like that, 
it's two steps removed of arbitrary. It is dependent on the calendar system and dependent on the decimal base 10 way that pi is written. What if we only want to be one level deep of arbitrariness? We're stuck with the arbitrariness of the calendar, but we're going to want to get not two levels deep by not needing to throw in the decimal or base 10 dependent version of pi. Well, what is an approximation of pi similar to 3.14, but not reliant on a base? Well, a classic is 22 sevenths, and many people would write yesterday's date as 22 divided by seven, because the slash you put in dates looks like divided by. Where I'm from, it would go 722, other way around. But I see the logic of the places that put the date first. There's some logic both sides. We have a bad system where you either got to put... It's sort of a lose-lose when you put the months first or the days first. I've made an episode about calendars. We'll go back into that someday when I have more thorough things to clearly roast about it. But 22 sevenths, as some people did comment correctly, is a classic approximation that was yesterday. Now we're doing a lot of circular pi related things, which is why they set the automatic range to be 12 pi for our maximum. But I want to see some of these other equations, starting with a much smaller range. Let's say I add some things. R equals theta times A for whatever my coefficient is times sine of that thing, a theta. Well, when I turn this one on, I'm only setting the range to check thetas from 0 to 1. So it's not able to do much, but it's sort of like I'm drawing... Let me zoom out a little bit. It's like this thing wants to draw a line. Yeah, look at the line it wants to draw. And as it draws the line, it sometimes bends the line that came before it. It's drawing a line. And then it gets stuck because I set a limited range. What if I set this to 5 instead of 1? Well, now as I draw my line, it's going quicker and crazier and looping around in a flower-like way. That's pretty strange. What if I set it to 50? Now, here's where we start to get really beautiful and interesting. I mean, all of it's interesting, but these ones are visually pretty stunning. So, as we go up, I start to create this whole coil. My string's drawing and unwinding and overlapping so quick that we get all these crazy states. And one here, I really like when we have one for our a, which means that this is the equation just for r equals theta sine theta. Same thing. Um, because it was set to one. Why do they look different? Oh, because they have different ranges. We'll set them both to go to 50. So... What I like about this is it's like an optical illusion. Let's look at it with the simpler equation, just so it's clear. This is the only equation because this set to 1 becomes that. So r equals theta times sine of theta looks like an optical illusion. Am I wrong? Does that not look like a cone coming toward the screen? You can create optical illusions with a very simple graph formula. Now, what's going to happen as I go back to allowing myself to edit this one? That's where it's at at one. But then we hit these strange, tangly blossoms. Sometimes it lines up nicely. Look at this one. Almost perfectly lined up in four, but not quite. Ooh, this one's close to three. And then we spiral. If you've ever played with an old game called Spirograph, it was like drawing these by hand. Now let's go from afar and look at them. Ooh. 
Look at these little tangles. And it's drawing a line. Remember how we saw that little line drawing and curling the line before it? Well, now we're getting it on a big scale. Oh, look at all these cool, beautiful flowers. Now, there's other things we could fiddle around with. I tried putting tangent instead of sine. Got pretty wacky. Goes pretty crazy pretty quick when we put tangent in there. So then I tried saying, what if we do some signs, but we throw the theta on the bottom? Well, this one, we're going to need to zoom in a bit more for what's going on there. Let's set to zero again. This is one where it's limited enough. We can sort of see it drawing itself. Not, I, let me set this. Can I set this step to less than 0.1? Let's see. So, going up this, it's drawing this strange line that's curling around and creating these weird shapes. There it kind of got the cone illusion almost. And then it's looping around and spiraling like that. Yeah. Now this looks straight up like I had programmed, a little program to be... Oh, when Demotro turns the dial, do a cool visual twiddling around thing. But it's not. I'm just changing A values in polar coordinates, radius equals sine of A times theta, all divided by theta. Sometimes a single equation can make the wackiest graphs. So... There's a few more. Let me take a peek at our comments, though. Love you all. Somebody said, is it still Pi Day in other countries? Very doubtful. Most countries are ahead of where I am, not behind. So if anything, you'll be on the next date, the 24th. Now, somebody said, never thought this is what I'd be doing on a random Sunday night. Yep, some, some nights I go party with friends or whatever. Other nights I find myself obsessing over a random little fun thing I find fun. It might be something that's not on stream. It might be writing a lot of song lyrics or part of a book. It might be reading. It might be this. And when it's this, I decide why not throw on the live stream, even if it's almost midnight in my time. Who knows what time zones of people will be up who knows what people will watch this in the future and gather some strange entertainment or knowledge from it. Oh, somebody says it's still Pi Day there? 722? Where are you that it's 722? I don't think it's 722 anywhere. It's very late on 723. If anything, it would be 724. I'm... The dumb thing is that I had in my notes yesterday to say that during yesterday's stream, when it actually was Pi Day, but I got distracted by yesterday's stream topics, and I never mentioned the part that it's Pi Approximation Day. So, we got that in today, last minute. Now, another thing we could try throwing in is, what if I do sign and maybe some square roots, something along those lines, some other ways of glitching out this system. Now, sine is our friend in these strange graph operations. Sometimes we bring in cosine, but it's very similar to sine in these effects. Sometimes we bring in tangent, but it's too powerful. Tangent blows stuff up to infinity and makes stuff way too crazy sometimes. So, sometimes we've got to keep our tangents for when necessary. Now, Looking at this one, I have A at zero, so no surprise we don't see much yet. I said, when is the radius sine of this sine of zero? So now, as I go forward, this is less looking like a string being drawn, although it could be viewed as that, and more like imagine a little ball of twine that is unraveling and re-raveling among its little threads spinning around. 
Now, there's even some that we could view like I'm pulling a thread somewhere. Like, ooh, this was one of the ones I put in the background, I guess. Let's see. How does this one work? Okay. This is a wild one. This one is radius is a times theta times the square root of sine of theta. When I found this one, I was like, ooh, we're putting that one in part of the thumbnail. It's sort of like my cone illusion that I found, but big. Now that's positive, so if I flip it negative, it goes down here. And yeah, the thumbnail's something like, uh, where, where are we? The thumbnail's one of these combined. You know, this at some phase and that at some phase. So, this is a fun one, this big blue ocean. It's like a ocean of ripples. And as I go like this, it shrinks. It's now a lake. It's not an ocean anymore. It's a conical lake. Now as we go back from the conical lake, it starts to seem like it's spreading, becoming an ocean. waves forming and glitching around all the little bugs we might create so those are the ones that i pre-programmed but there are so many ways we could fiddle around with these somebody requested a secant and let's just see for example does a secant change much in this mix if i replace my sign with my secant here we get something rather different so Let's replace tangent here that was sine originally with secant. Secant is another trig operation. And, ooh, that's pretty cool. Whoa. Thank you to Nandan for recommending this secant. Look at this. This is like a crazy spiderweb cocoon metamorphosis. Whoa. And if we ever get four things curling around, don't be like all the people when it showed up in a video of mine once who were like, he made a swastika. Chill out. I'm Jewish. My grandfather was in the Holocaust. We're going to pass things that look a little like that once in a while. Nobody said that here, but when I made a video that happened to look like a rotational symmetry like this, but had four prongs, people got really mad. But trust me, I am born out of Holocaust survivors. It's just a shape that comes up. And welcome to Magic Fellow who stopped by, one of our main Discord moderators and combo lords in general. And let's see what else we got in our comments. A lot of fun people popping by with some random thoughts. This one's pretty cool, and whenever I see a cool one, I like to see what happens if I turn it to an inequality. Now I'm saying when is the radius less than that? Whoa, that's almost even cooler. This is like uh, the logo of the next Batman. Ooh, that's pretty neat. Now, it stops at certain points because we're only going to 50. Let's try going to 100 and give it some more spikes. So if I increase it, it adds more. Whoa, these look like almost like... Highway. This looks like a human-built city highway structure. But if I make it too far, it blacks out the screen. That's when it's showing all of the points where R does that up through a thousand. It's too many points. It blacks out the screen for how they're trying to display it. I mean, not every point does it, but how are they going to display that there's like an infinite amount of points clogging up the space that do do it? So... We have to limit how far it goes. I can also make it symmetrical by throwing in a negative side. Now it's more symmetrical, for better or for worse. So that's pretty cool. What happens when we uh, throw inequalities on some of these and or throw secants on some of these?
Ooh, yeah. So this is the one I wanted to view as like, let's make this a, a darker color and let's view this as a string being unwound. You know how sometimes there's like a tiny bit of string all balled up on like a sweater or wherever and you try and pull the string and it's longer than you think and it starts curling all the other stuff around it. Well, we got a graph for that. This is the graph for that. I'm not going to do the inequality, actually. It'll look more string-like in this fashion. Oh, no, wait. It went too fast. How can I get it to go really slow? Oh, that didn't work. I wanted it to go really slow. There's an, a string unwinding effect. What happened here? Whoa, that's looking cool. Um, let's change our steps so we can glide a little more easily. How do we do that? Where do I change? There's no step level on this, I guess, for polar coordinates. It's only for X, Y's, I guess. But that's pretty cool. Ooh, whoa, we're generating strange vortexes. Somebody said, uh, could we replace the tangent with tangent to the 1 over 2 to the 2 times n factorial? That's going to confuse things on the graph. Now, when we throw factorials into the mix, those want to talk about the negative sector of the graph. And general factorials are not even really a graphable thing because general factorials in the purest definition only work for integers. And so to extend it, you're making a line through all the factorials that tries to connect them and then wants to do something over on the negative side. And it's an extension of the gamma function or there's another one called the pi function. And a few, the most popular is the gamma function that I'm assuming they're doing like gamma function minus one to be the factorial because gamma function slid over or is it plus one the gamma function it always messes every mathematician up of which direction you slide it so plus one or minus one the gamma functions one higher or lower than the factorial but if i try and just do that for fun like just say what's y equals n factorial they not only make the factorials shoot up to the sky, passing the points like one, one, and then we get two, and then we get six, so it passes the points correctly. But it also includes the... They stop trying over here for some reason on this graph. There would be more of them there. I think this confused the computer or something. Should be more of these. Uh, it does this weird loopy thing in the negative zone when you try and extend the factorials to that realm using what's called the gamma function. So factorials in the midst of all this stuff might be a bit too crazy. Like we can try throwing a factorial on one and seeing what happens, but sometimes it just makes it too crazy. Wait, am I zoomed too far in or out? Uh-oh, I'm lost in the darkness. Where am I? Okay. There we go. This one is blacking out the screen right now for some reason. Maybe because I made it the inequality and secant. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Whoa. All right. Now, let's replace a few more with secants. That worked pretty well. Now, this one is sort of weird. It has a limited amount of space. What about this one? What happens if I turn this to a secant? Well, first, let's do inequality. There's the inequality form. Now, back to equals, but secanting it. Ah, interesting. Now, what if I do the inequality there? Hmm... 
Interesting. Whoa. One more to test what happens when we turn this into other things. This one's fun. It's a whole blue ocean. So let's see what happens when we turn our blue ocean. First, let's try tangent to see how sometimes it blows stuff up in a weird way. This actually worked. This tangent just curved the ocean. That's pretty neat. We got a curved ocean from our tangent. And there is secant and stuff like that. Okay, now what about this one being secant? That puts the ocean in this curvy way. This is like a beach. It's a more tame ocean. You got your beach right there. The other one had sort of a beach, but this one feels like all the waves are going to the same spot or something. So a lot of fun variations we could apply to these to make them get quite wacky. Now, we're going to do a little more experimenting. I do need to go pee real quick. I'll be back in a moment. Let's put a cool graph on the screen and we can look at this one for the time being. Sometimes I can even make it play while I'm gone. Oh, too fast. How really slow speed. Slower even. I need the slowest. That's the slowest speed they got. Okay. Whoa, that is pretty wild. Okay. So that's actually a real good, uh, background visualization that's really cool what does it look like zoomed out whoa oh my god that is really crazy whoa look in the set stare in the center of this it's really crazy this is one equation this is this equation with the black thing right there it's just going up and down the a's slowly Okay, uh, I'll be back in one sec. All right, that is insane. I can't believe this one looks like a cooler version of a screensaver or something. What do the other ones look like when we play them at this slower speed? Is that, this one's not doing much. This one's all right. This one's just spinning around like a clock. It's like a clock with a ton of hands. Whoa, the ocean's moving. The ocean's coming. Whoa, this is weird. The ocean's like crunching together. The waves are flowing. Okay, so, and they are like optical illusions. They really trip out the eyes. And I like optical illusions. I even have a book of them around here. There's the book of optical illusions. We showed this in the last stream, but might as well bust it out for the subject matter. Whereas there's a lot of books we have here. Where's the optical illusion one? Uh, I'm trying to find it in my pile of books. Maybe we'll do the optical illusion book in a bit. You can watch the other stream for that if you need. The point is, as you know, we like optical illusions. They're neat. It tricks the eye into seeing something strange. 
when I was a kid, I used to like, you know, those ones where you stare at a certain dot or something, and then you look somewhere else and the colors change or your vision warps in some way. Those were wild, and they still are. So I think optical illusions are cool, and I can't believe that we are making them out of single graphs. And somebody said a video, possibly. Yeah, someday I would love to make a video topic about optical illusions. I have a few notes about that, like I do for many topics. It's one of the topics that I don't have enough of a brainstorm for that I anticipate coming in grade negative two that we're in. But I anticipate someday there will be an episode on the main channel about optical illusions. Uh, probably not grade negative two, but we'll see. That was cool. It glitched over right there. Now, anybody around want a little field trip before we play with some more graphs? Because, you know, I know there's one thing edible if we take a little field trip. And what that is, is the garden started growing blackberries. So if we took a little stroll out into the yard that I share with some neighbors, we might need to take a little field trip to get a fresh first combo blackberry of the season. Now, I'm going to go on a little hike like I like doing sometimes before long at the marina near where I live, a bunch of park-like areas by the water, at a certain spot that I know either like next week, the week after, the week after, at some point in the next few months, I know a spot that will have what I call infinite blackberries. I call it that because there's more than you could possibly eat or use for anything. You can bring a big Tupperware and completely fill it, and there's still more than enough for the next person. So I see it as almost infinite. You know, there should be possibly a term for that sort of infinite maybe arbitrarily large is almost the right title like a a bigger finite number than anyone you could pick there's an arbitrarily large amount of blackberries there not literally you know there's actually a smaller finite number in the i don't know tens of thousands there's a lot we got cool spots i know around town for some reason here in the bay area blackberries are the ones that take over and grow. I don't even think it's the native type of blackberries, unfortunately. I think it's a non-native one that's really good at rooting its way around, but I'm not positive. And the blackberries are all over. I've gotten a little spoiled in almost thinking blueberries and raspberries feel rarer to me because they don't grow everywhere. So blackberries like aren't one of my top three berries. And I wonder if it's just the flavor or if it's due to exposure that I've had the ability to get them much easier. But every fall, I love foraging and finding fruits and not really fall, more like peak of summer to late summer. There's such good blackberries certain places. And I'll make pies, I'll make all sorts of cool stuff. So we're going to have some sort of snack break sometime about the infinite Blackberry Zone. But I think let's do a little miniature field trip now for a moment where we're going to get a fresh Blackberry. I'm putting the stream just the screen just on this so that we can uh, go out. And in fact, just to be safe, I'm going to mute the audio for like 10 seconds while I walk out the living room. Just in case someone's watching something on the TV and then it goes in like in copyright bites me or something. I don't, I have my music playing in the background there and a fan on because I, I don't want any copyright stuff bugging me through YouTube's end. So I'm going to mute the audio for one sec and then we're going to be at some blackberries. Okay, I'm actually pausing by my living room because I have to show you something really cute. 
I know we have some fans of this fella in the chat, probably. Some fans of this fella, at least we'll watch it later. Somebody's going to want to need to get their dandelion cameo. Hi, dandelion. You know, dandelion, the fluffiest cat on the block, the nicest, softest, silkiest cat on the block, who loves getting his belly rubbed, who is very silly and awesome. Yeah, the little dandelion. So, okay, I had to get a little dandelion cameo just for one second. There's your dandelion before we get our blackberry. All right, now we're next to a strange horn right here. You see this horn? That's been hanging on the wall for a while. It's an old rusty thing. But next to this horn, what's that? Are those blackberries? Could those be ripe, wonderful blackberries growing off a vine? Now, for anyone who doesn't know for some reason, when you eat fresh fruit, it tastes so much better than the fruit in supermarkets because the fruit there has to go through shipping procedures and often refrigeration. And refrigerating and shipping these fruits for days does not help their flavor. Fruits taste great when you get them right off the vine. Now, a cat's coming. Oh my god, a skunk. It's not a cat. That is a straight up skunk. I got footage that I showed of a skunk, a, the, a different stream, or like maybe to my Patreon or something, of a skunk went in the classroom the other day, like a few weeks ago, but that is a skunk. Now, I'm not really that scared of the skunks, but they're not necessarily my friends because they cause some chaos. Now, I do have a really cool thing. I need to mix with this blackberry before I pick it, because not only are we gonna eat the blackberry, but I want to make a combo fruit. Sometimes we make a three layer combo fruit. We're gonna make a two layer combo fruit right now, but it's still gonna be worth it. So let me run inside and grab the outer layer. The blackberry will be the inner layer of our combo fruit. And we're gonna construct a little bonus. Oh, here we go. here's actually a cat. That spooked me. I thought that might've been a skunk. Is that Sage? Hi, Sage. Oh, that's Sage. Oh, yeah, Sage Poo. Okay, I have to be careful. Now, uh, let me run and grab the outer layer of our multi fruit. I, I called it a combo fruit, but um, there there's various ways to combine fruit and make combo fruit. So, this one, I have a few techniques. One is called the micro fruit salad. We'll do that one sometime. One is called the multi fruit. And we're gonna do the multi-fruit right now. So let me grab the outer layer real quick.
glad that took a second. I got my multi-fruit shell. Here's how the multi-fruits work. Some fruits have peels. We're going to do a snack break very soon about surprisingly edible peels. That's good. The next episode on the Main Combo Class channel is Colat's Conjecture in Binary. The episode after will probably be a snack break about edible peels. But here, very underrated fruit, the apricot. A lot of people have gotten mushy apricots or bland apricots or something and say that apricots are not one of the top five fruits, but they are. Apricots are magnificent. If I had to rank my fruits, apricots might be second beyond cherry. I think a cherry would beat an apricot, but apricots are one of the greatest fruits of all time. And these fruits do have a pit in the inside that you always have to encounter and deal with. Many people have not had a good apricot. This isn't the best one ever. This is gonna be a decent apricot I got from, you know, a store that sells fruits. But there is apricot trees I've had. I've had them fresh off the tree. And oh boy, I'm not joking when I say, if you have fresh fruit, and often fruit from a farmer's market will do the trick. You can go to farmer's markets and get some good fruit that was picked not long after or is sold not long after it was picked. But here, you see how I've removed the pit? What am I gonna do with the spot where the pit was? Well, maybe we could put something yummy in there so that we don't have to eat any pit and that we just can take a bite into an apricot as if it had a pit, but instead of a pit, it has a fresh blackberry that we pick off the vine. How does that sound, folks? Now let's turn up the maximum brightness here so we can, you know, this thing is going all over and it has thorns. I'm not worried about the blackberry plant getting messed up in any way. These things are invasive. It didn't, it wasn't here like a year ago. They crawl and climb everywhere and just like make their way through this dirt in this climate. These things thrive everywhere. Now here we got our blackberry bits. And that is a fresh blackberry straight off of our vine. So what we're gonna do with our fresh blackberry is replace the apricot pit with it. So apricot had, the, had a pit, now has that. The reason I say we sometimes go three layer is that we've done one before where you have an apricot with a cherry in it, with a blueberry in it. And if I had to have one signature meal at a diner or something, let's make it that for now while I work on the details of what the actual signature meal would be. For now, our stand-in will be an apricot with a cherry for the pit, with a blueberry for the pit. It's like a turducken of fruits. Here we got a two-layer one, but it's still really good. Mm. Bite it right in. Don't have to worry about biting through the pit. Get in even better inside where the pit was. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, folks. It's almost midnight, which is why I'm talking really quiet out here because I don't want to bug the whole neighborhood. Let me relocate us back to my room where it can be a little louder. So once again, to make sure we don't get any copyright noise, no addresses and nothing. I'm turning off the audio for like 10 seconds, but we're about to do some more graphs in my room.
I don't know how I bumped that password manager thingy. That's bad. I don't think I bumped any private info. You already know my real name. That's okay. That's already in the credits. Uh, trust me, I'm uh, cocky enough to think that combo class will go big places someday, and I want my real name in the credits anyway. But I also, I like Demotro as a mononym, so remember that if you ever write any articles, if you're a newspaperist or any of those things, three phrases you may want to consider including to help our combo mission are Demotro, Combo Class, and Threven. That is not for me, that is for the world. If you are if you write articles, put use the word Threven in casual conversation in your article. That's not for me, that's for the world. So love you all. Hope you appreciated a little snack break. We're back in my room where I can be mildly louder now. We're just gonna fiddle around with graphs a little more. I didn't have any other ones pulled up on the get-go, but I knew that we had only touched the tip of the iceberg, turning these sequins back to signs and say, what if I put a sign on one of these and then I multiply it by the secant? What if I put two together in a thing? What's gonna happen? Well, I didn't put an A in there anywhere. That's when we have an A there. What if we put the A in both places? Ooh. Now, what if we make this an inequality? Now we are getting our flowers, our strange, magnificent flowers. Let's see if we can play this one in slow-mo. Now, it goes way too fast. That's the slowest it can go. The reason is because when we put a variable in just the front and I watch the slider, it's just going to make it like grow and that's going to be stable. If I do add a variable plus a variable, it's just going to slide it in a way in the polar coordinates. However, if I put a variable in the signs and secants, minor little tw twitches in those can affect it hugely. You can go over 0.1 coordinate and the secant of that is far different that makes it ripple apart in a different way. So. It flies much faster when we stick the variable coefficient within the signs or secants. With that said, though, I figured we can still play around with these a bit more by adding, subtracting, and changing some bits of them. This is one of the most magnificent ones we've seen. In fact, if I make this less or greater than... Uh-oh, that's not... Oh, whoa, we got a flash of light right there. Almost nothing. <laughs> what if we changes a bit. What if I put an add instead of a times right there? When we have nothing between the terms, it automatically multiplies them. It's good to know what's automatically happening so we can tweak that. Like for example, why did I say when A is one, it has a certain trait? Well, when A is one, the A's vanish because this is a multiplicative setup. So A is skewed around one as a center point. We can kind of change things by putting pluses instead of times. Whoa, okay, okay, slow down. This looks like a whole galaxy. This is like you have planets and worlds and look at the, the this is like when the galaxy was first for, oh my God, this is how the universe started. No, I'm joking, but it looks like it. Tell me this doesn't look like the big bang of another universe. It's going way too fast when we do the slider. I have to go as, okay. What is the smallest scale I can make this? Step point zero, zero one. So I want to show the beginning of my fictional universe that we've created together. Here's the beginning. The universe started as a circle. It's not our universe. Don't get all flat earthy with this info. This is a fictional thing. Then the universe began exploding in a chaotic way. Tendrils flying everywhere. Sometimes finding little leeways where they would, or ley lines or whatever, where they would fly to particular little highways. Sometimes flying in all directions. Maybe seeking chaos. Or maybe seeking some sort of structure. Because as the universe began to form further, 
this chaos began to have structural elements that we could notice. Now, there's a lot of strange stuff going on here. That's not even the lesser equal because that blots it out. I don't know if there's many values on here where that's not. Okay, there. This is like the creepy version of the universe. This is like, here's the sun. You ready? It explodes. That's the creepy version of the universe. <laughs> so, what about some more universes? You know, we get to make universes. We're, we're all of a sudden gods just by having Desmos, a random graphing app. Not promoting Desmos. We're not sponsored by them. You could have your GeoGebra or whatever you want for this. I have found GeoGebra is actually not as good for 2D graphing like this. It's better for the things it can do that Desmos can't, such as 3D things. This one's funny. It's making these strange different zones. Now, what if we try and add some of the other weird things we've played around with in the past? I don't know if this is going to work or not. But what if we try and use our mod thing? Where, for example, this is saying N in mod 1 is the weird way that's phrased. And now we're saying the radius is that. That's pretty cool. So, what if I put sign of n? Well, that's pretty strange. We got these weird little webs dancing around different corners. That's pretty cool. Yeah, they fly into a little infinity. You want to know where it hits? Well, let's see where it hits. Hmm, 3.14 something? Ring any bells? Yeah, it's hitting at multiples of pi, is whenever it's touching the glitchy infinite. It's both when it's touching the axis and when it's getting infinitely dense. A singularity occurs every pi. Now, this is why the pi versus tau debate is sort of silly. It's like, yes... Pi is the amount per cycle, so that's important. Tau, which is 2 pi, and some people think should replace pi, is the fuller cycle. It shows all of that. If we go 2 pi, it's like a copy of the next cycle. So yes, 2 pi is more of a copy of the cycle. But I say tau is less necessary if we allow negatives, because we can range from negative pi to pi and cover the whole cycle. Bam. Now, let's make some more cool graphs. Can I put sign around this, or is that just going to make everything too wild? That's not going to work. Now, let's... What about secant? Okay, that's... Secant did this this time with these little platforms. This looks like a Mario game. Now, you always see different things in the graphs. When I play this graph live stream game, you never know if I'm going to be like, I see an eye, or a, like, I see a palm frond, or like, I see a Super Mario level. This one looks like a Super Mario level to me. You can see anything in graphs, because a lot of stuff's numbers secretly, and the funny thing is, it's not necessarily that if we make a graph that looks like an eye, that that equation is the equation happening in an eye. But it shows that something that numbers strive toward in a strange way, something that numbers are trying to do, can be seen in natural selection, in evolution, in the way that things like eyes and flowers and Super Mario levels evolve over time. So, very interesting to think about the relationship of when we see something that looks like nature, to what degree did nature stumble into that thing for a coincidental or a correlated reason, maybe even a causal, causality, you know, reason, between 
those. So anyway, lots of stuff to ponder when we see funny things in the graphs. Here, let's see what happens if I throw a little mod right here. What if instead of that, it's mod one theta? Pretty similar web to before. What if I put the mod on this one as well? Let's put A for what it is instead of one. And we're gonna take off that end bit. Whoa, this is giving it a lot of trouble. It's like taking a minute for the graph to catch up. Um, somebody said, what's my real name? They asked, I, the only reason I mentioned it, this response to the chat, is that it came up on the password thing when I was bumping stuff, trying to get us back indoors after I ate a cool snack break. But my real name is in the combo class credits. It is Dimitri Zucker. Uh, not related to any of the Zuckerbergs or anything like that. That guy is annoying. The, it's... Zucker is my family name from a German origin, and it actually came from my grandpa, who was in the Holocaust, escaped Germany, went to New York, and now I'm on the other side of America. But that is my real name, and I'm still wondering whether when I publish books, I'll put that on it. Whether I'll put Demotro on it or both. Because I like going for a mononym. There's a lot of Dimitris out there. So a nickname I've used before, Demotro, that fits this side of my personality that I use when I'm filming. That is a nickname I've had. Works better as a mononym than going with other ones. And somehow when you look up Demotro, you do get me. So the mononym is working and let's continue. That's why I said that's one of the three phrases for any journalist to put in your article. Demotro, combo class, and Threven slash Throd. The reason I pulled up the full screen is I want to show like, even though I do have a longer full name, Demotro is working well because if I search Demotro, I know it's biased, my search results, but I think it would happen on your end, too, from a neutral computer, that you would get stuff like this. Um, my YouTube channel, for some reason, the Instagram, this is like a private Instagram page. I sometimes post stuff there, you can feel free to follow it, but there's cool photos of me, but it's not that much rare behind the scenes stuff. Most of this stuff gets covered in the streams, but I don't post on there that much. That's a personal one that I had called Demotro, but now it's attached to this, so whatever. If you use Instagram, you can follow that one in case I post something cool. But in general, looking at our fun graphs and stuff, let's... Somebody said good morning. It's not morning for me, certainly. Uh, it is just past midnight. And that means I should wrap up the stream soon. I am going to probably cap it off now that we've gone up to an hour pretty soon. So we're going to fiddle around with a few more mods. And I, I'm going to do a bit more. But as a reminder for anybody who doesn't catch the end or who leaves or whatever, the most important thing is that you've seen my new combo class episode linked in the description about Beyond Fermat's Last Theorem. That's my better edited, more thorough stuff. Now, as far as this stream, let's throw a couple mods in the mix. What if I have a mod of A to that? This is going to be wacky. Whoa, it's like a ball and some strings. This is one graph. The ball is because there's too much info in that zone for it to not blot out all the stuff. Ball and string. That one's fun. What if I take that away? Ooh, tangling ball and string. Ooh. This is an, another alternate universe. It's like... The universe exploded, and then this shard began to spin. And it spun until the spinning created all the planets. So a lot of cool alternate universes there. 
I'm probably going to cut off the stream now, but I love you all so much. I know people like the graph streams. Maybe I will work those into more bonus videos, more maybe a full episode at some point. But our next full episode is already mostly filmed. It is about the Colatz conjecture, but in binary. And in general, we're going to talk about this big open problem in math that a lot of people love and a lot of false proofs are out there and hasn't actually been solved yet. And we'll talk about the kind of like the last episode. First half will be kind of what is this big open problem? Second half will be here's a unique spin and future and extension and etc. to it that you may not have seen before, even if you knew the first half. But... Make sure to watch those combo class ones in full. I've been having fun putting random shots with my cats, with my flames, and all my stuff. Now, as far as this channel, I do have some shorts to upload. I'll try and put those out this week. And there'll be a lot more fun bonus content as well. So, I'm going to see you guys before long. I'll see you in either a bonus video, live stream, or short. Probably tomorrow. But... Technically today, for me, it is uh, just past midnight, so technically the same day. But I love you all. I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for joining me here. Check all the cool links in the description, like uh, not only the last episode, but uh, we got a Discord with lots of cool chatting. We got a subreddit for people who use that. We've got which I actually use Reddit more than Discord apart from the combo class one. So I need to check the combo class subreddit more. But we also got, I always feel guilty saying this, but we have a Patreon for people who are extra cool and able to support our mission. Help us hire people, us meaning me, help me hire people throughout the week to help make my dreams turn into cool teaching plans and cool stories and videos to present. So anyone who really has a little extra budget might want to consider checking out the Patreon. Love you all so much though. In any case, one thing that does help us on this channel is after the stream's done, it posts on the live tab. If you come back later at some point, whether it's right after it does that or later, and leave some random comment. If you don't know what sort of comment to leave, leave a comment about uh, which thing you'd like to see the most out of my particular fruits and animals and things. And well, Okay, that's an actually complicated question. If you don't know what comment to leave, just say, um, Combo Lord reporting for duty. But leave whatever comment you want. Uh, when the video actually posts, because those actually help more people get shown the full long stream after. Because I feel like some people are going to want to watch that weird optical illusion that we got earlier in this stream. And some other fun stuff. In any case, I love you all so much. Thank you, my combo lords. I will catch you in the next one. Make sure you're up to date on the main combo class episodes. And I hope you have a great day and night, whatever time.